Good morning, everybody. How are we all doing? Sam at United People's TV. I hope we're live and direct on YouTube and Facebook. I know YouTube's working. Let me just make sure the Facebook is working. I can't actually see the comments from Facebook. Is it one of those? It may be one of those today. I hope not. But good morning to everybody. How are you all doing? 14th of March. We're here. We've got Liverpool in a couple of days. Ah, the Facebook comments coming in. Boo, 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 boo. Um, but look, how are we all doing? Jeez, that was a weird one. Uh, lots of comments coming in. I'm losing my mind. Let me get back in. the th Right, let's go. Okay. That was slightly confusing. Good morning. <laughs> let's pretend that didn't happen. Um, we're going to be speaking about some... There's always news at United, isn't it? It's mad. Uh, today, we're going to be speaking about Jim Ratcliffe. Well, probably Jim Ratcliffe paying off £120 million worth of Manchester United's borrowings. Confirmation of that last night in further financial reports sent to Security and Exchanges Commission in America. We're going to run through that. Also, Jim Ratcliffe is planning major cost cuts at Manchester United. Up to 25% of the staff could be leaving. What does that mean? Why are they doing that? Is that just him being another glazer? That's just him saving money? No. Is him making Manchester United more efficient so that we can spend more? That's going to be part of it. We're going to speak about Marcus Rashford and PSV. PSG. Probably not PSV. Don't think they can afford him. We'll speak about Lissandro Martinez and an expected return date against Brentford, which is exciting. And also a little bit more about that Argentina stuff, which I'm still quite annoyed about. And there's lots of other stuff. Barcelona and Greenwood, Anthony being sold, and maybe a new head of recruitment name. Lots to run through. Let me know where you're watching from. Where you're watching from? I've been all over the shop this week. <laughs> ah, we'll be back to normal next week, hopefully. Uh, good morning to everybody. Who's here from the member gang? Garlic Bread Man, good morning to you, man. Mania, Josh, we've got Gungshi. How you doing, man? Ian, you're there too. Anuj, Wendy, Carl, lots of mods here. How you doing, guys and girls? Um, Sam man, we've got John and you're up there. Poz, we've got T, we've got Paramount, Lone Wolf, Franklin, AJ, Ebifemi, who's on Facebook now that everything's working properly. Carl Barkley, good morning to you. Thomas Hayes, Odame, we've got Agu. Uh, let's get a couple more names. We've got um, Osan and Wayne. Good morning to all of you. Thank you for tuning in as always. Fire in your comments, fire in your questions over the next 45 minutes, 50 minutes or so, and we'll run through all the latest United news to bring you bang up to date. And also, I want to start, as always, with a little conversation about other things that happened around football last night. Anybody watch the Inter Atletico Madrid game? I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a really, really good game of football. Uh, Inter, I like watching Inter uh, under Inzaghi. I've watched a couple of games. I haven't watched mad amounts. I really wish I had more time, more time to, it's like you can't possibly, it's like, I can completely understand why Ten Hag is sort of, I don't know why I'm comparing these two things, but it kind of makes sense in my head. Uh, Ten Hag having to do the recruitment and the, and the coaching and all these things. If you do all of them, you can't possibly become a master at anything because you're spreading yourself. And with the, like with United, I want to properly look in depth at, in every single player that we are linked with, with every manager who could potentially take over. Inzaghi, one of those managers. Deserbi is another one of those managers. Uh, who else has been linked? Nagelsmann. But it is impossible. Anyway, last night it was, it was enjoyable to watch that game. I thought it was a good tactical battle. But my word, they were poor penalties. My word, they were poor penalties from, um, from, Athlet, no, from Inter Milan. Alexis Sanchez. Every time I look at him, I just remember how bad, how bad that signing was for our club. And I, and I'm, and I say every time I speak about him, it, by far and away, the worst signing we've made post Fergie and we are still reeling from it. Gungshi, my Don, how you doing, man? Still not on the Discord. I think it's because you want to keep yourself private. That's your choice. But thank you so much for always helping the community. Um, so that happened last night and also this happened last night Jaden Sancho getting a goal after three minutes I think it was something like that for Borussia Dortmund um, looked like he was enjoying himself one man in the match Dortmund went through beat PSV and they're in the round of was it 
quarterfinals now, into the last eight. Good. Every everything about that is good. Good for Jaden Sancho going out there enjoying his football again, and looking far more like the Jaden Sancho that we go. Well, okay, well, where are you? Good for Jaden Sancho. Good for Dortmund. They've got a player that makes them better. Good for, good for United. Because that means we need Jaden Sancho to put himself, in the, not in the shop window, but we need Jaden Sancho to prove to people that, just sign him, right? This isn't, they're, 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 I don't, well, I do, it's the internet, right? Just people thrive in certain environments and, and what they want. And people love trolling. I, but I don't understand how any United fan has any sort of energy to 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 use that game last night and go, wow, Ten Hag's made a mistake. Oh, I can't wait for Jaden Sancho. Like, sod that. Capital S-O-D, sod that. Don't want Jaden Sancho back at my football club. I want Manchester United to sell Jaden Sancho, go, well, that could have that could have been great. Never mind. Good luck elsewhere. Let's reinvest. Because he's still, what, he's only like 23. So is he 23? I think he's 23. He's got really good real resale value, and we want him to do well there. That's why I think so, anyway. Claus, how you doing down there? And Tom, you just gifted five memberships. Yee hee! Woohoo! Weird noises coming out of my mouth. I'm still not quite with it yet, so I, I, I might say some weird things in this show. Um, Sancho, good. Keep it up. Put yourself in the shop window. Want to sell you. Want to reinvest the money. Lovely. Now, it's it's kind of sad, really. I'll be completely honest. It's kind of sad that it's sad that I've got to put so much bloody time into looking at the race for the additional Champions League spots because that's how crap Man United are. <laughs> We're not even in the top five yet. <laughs> we are just like hanging onto the coattails of possibly getting Champions League football next season. Not because we think we're going to win Champions League next season, but because we know how important it is for the financial success of our budget. I think a lot of it re revolves around getting into the Champions League. Now, these are the coefficient rankings. Vincent, thank you very much, dude, for gifting a membership down there, Don. Um, Matt, not Man United. England currently third in the coefficient rankings, right? And what I found out last night, which I didn't actually know, is this, right? The coefficient system is designed to assess the overall strength of the leagues and wins are worth the same in all competitions. I just expected, because obviously the Champions League is the absolute top, I just expected that wins in the Champions League will be worth more. But it turns out that's not the case. And that wins in the Champions League, the Europa League, and the Conference League are worth all the same amount of points. So if you see there that England has still got six clubs left in. Now, Brighton got absolutely pumped, right? These are the games there that are left. Brighton got absolutely pumped by Roma. So it's very unlikely, all right? It's very unlikely that they go through. So they're not going to get any points there, which means there's more points to Italy. West Ham, they lost against Freiburg. That's going to be a big one, right? It's You know, I, I don't, do you remember, I don't know whether it's a thing that still exists, but I, when I was a kid, there was always a question, oh, do you just support the English team just because they're English? You go, no, no I wouldn't. Is that question still asked now? I don't know. But definitely that game between West Ham and Freiburg, we've all, United fans have got to be sitting there, come on, West Ham, do the job, right? Do the job. So basically, we're, <laughs> we're all sitting here supporting Villa against Ajax. We're supporting West Ham against Freiburg. We're hoping that Arsenal and City can get through to the semi-finals and then both collapse. That'll do. I'm fine. You can enjoy a semi-final if you want, but no, no further than that. Thank you very much. Off you pop. And Liverpool, it gives a toss what they do anyway. They can just lose the final. That'll be fine. But yeah, that's the rankings as it stands. And the top two, you know, get an extra Champions League spot. That means... If, you, if England finish in that top two, fifth spot will get a Champions League place next season. Uh, and you're saying you don't want Champions League football so we can focus. Now, sod that, mate. Give me Champions League football. We need it. 
well, we need it for the finances more than anything. I'm, I, I don't know about that. We're some way off winning the Champions League. But let's be completely honest. Anything can happen in the Champions League. Look at what happened when Chelsea ran it. Hmm. Anyway, that's the Champions League out of the way. Let's move on to a very interesting talking point this morning. Because the big D, debt, <laughs> is, is probably one of the biggest buzzwords for all United fans around Jim Ratcliffe, around Ineos, and around the new ownership. What's happening to the debt? We covered it yesterday that Manchester United's debt overall, that means the actual debt to the banks, that means transfer payments that are owed, that means club borrowings, all that added together, Man United's debt is in excess of a billion pounds. And it's, um, it's infuriating. So at least we've got some good news here that I can run through this morning, all right? Manchester United have cleared £120 million worth of club debt following Jim Ratcliffe's investment. And we go here and we see what the filing is. So this is the filing that's sent to the Security and Exchanges Commission, which is a bit more of an in-depth... You know the financial reports were released. This is more of an in-depth one, okay? And this is written in there. On the 28th of Feb, a repayment of the group's revolving facilities, a.k.a. Manchester United's credit card. All right? That's how we've been signing players. We've literally been signing players on a store card, effectively. That's how skint we've been. Now, 120 million of that has been paid off. All the, all the different ones. One, one facility with the Bank of America, one, another facility with the Bank of America, another one with Santander. Three different loans that we've got. And that now reduces Manchester United's revolving credit facilities down to... 140 million from 260. Okay, and it's going to a little bit more detail here in the athletic. Um, there you go, 120 million has been cleared. So Jim Ratcliffe put in to the club 230. No, he, he hasn't put 234 million in it. He's only put 200 in. I think he's put he's put 200 million dollars in, and another 100 million dollars is going to be going in. I think in December. By the end of the year, but by the time the next uh, annual report comes out, that whole 300 mil is in. This is a good thing, all right? This is absolutely a good thing. Does this give Manchester United the ability to spend more straight away? Well, absolutely it does, right? Because now Man United have got, bear in mind, our borrowings were 260 million of a total 300 million. That's now 140 million. You can, you can do the maths there. That's 160 million that we've got now. Ish. I mean, say got, that's 160 million on a credit card we can spend, whereas previously we could only spend, am I doing my maths wrong here? I think I am a little bit. No, 160 million we could spend, whereas previously we could only spend 120, 40 million. Good. Uh, someone down in the comments saying it will take some time to clear the debt. It absolutely will, right? And I've said this to you. Um, all of us want this debt cleared, okay? We all, that's, that is one of the, when that happens, is going to be a monumental moment. Manchester United were debt-free before the Glazers came in and bought the club, and we've been saddled with debt since. It's always been a straitjacket for success. Fergie managed to navigate his way through it because he was a genius, and we were united at that point in time. But when we lost being united, and we've just, thrown cash drunkenly and see what sticks on the wall and it's blown up in our face we're at this top basically what Jim Ratcliffe and Ineos are doing right now I call it like financial housekeeping okay there's two ways to make Manchester United more efficient right as a business and that's crucial it might be boring but it the fact that we haven't done I I think I've said this to you before I really shouldn't, as a, as a football fan, I shouldn't be getting so excited about my club appointing a, a bloody CEO, man. Or my club appointing a sporting director. You know how boring that is? In, uh, in isolation, when you step away, you go, why are you getting excited about the business dude who's going to sit at the top of the club? It doesn't make any sense. 
Because it doesn't. But United have just not had this structure in place ever to the point where it makes it exciting when you see our club actually operating properly. And a big part of our club operating properly is our club being efficient as a business. Two ways of doing that. Number one, make more money. All right? Bring in loads of new sponsors, bring in a new stadium, more match day revenue, be good at football, get into the Champions League, improve your revenues. Good. Number two, reduce your bottom line. Reduce costs. They're your two ways to get yourself to an efficient business. If you can do both at the same time, you can increase your revenues and you can decrease your costs, then it's like double efficient. Now, when it comes to revenues at Manchester United, that's pretty much reflected by how well the football team does. It's more of a long-term thing. In the short term, you can stop spending so much money. And that's why this is important. Again, on the surface, why on earth would a football fan have get excited about the club cutting staff costs? I know that's right. But these are the things we have to get excited. Not have to get excited. You, you can ignore it if you want. These are the things I'm going to get excited about. Because once we've just... Once we get all of this boring stuff out of the way, new CEO, new sporting director, new structure in place, oh, actually, you know, reducing the costs, operational costs of our business, then things can start to work properly. Then you build in a new recruitment team on top of that. Brilliant. You start to make the right signings. Actually get better at setting players. Okay, we're actually getting some good money in for Greenwood this summer, for Sancho this summer, maybe for McTominay, maybe for anybody else who leaves. Okay, well, that's a difference. And all these little... If you want to call it marginal gains, they're not particularly marginal, but the gains. All of these things together is going to make United actually operate properly. And then you can get excited. All of a sudden, we can afford these big signings. All of a sudden, we're making the right signings. All of a sudden, we're actually good on the football pitch. And this is a big part of it, right? So let's read this. By the way, this has been coming for a while. This isn't like, wow, look, out of nowhere, there's a major cost cutting drive at United. No. I know that United are cutting costs. I know that United are cutting staff. This is what's being written here by James Ducker, okay? Jim Ratcliffe has appointed a corporate... Re and I'll be honest, I think this feels like a lunchtime video for me today, all right? So I won't go into too much detail. But this is a big one. In fact, I'll save the majority of the detail for the video, but I'll tell you this one thing here, right, which is important. So we have appointed a corporate restructuring firm who comes in and says, okay, all your employees, how many people do you employ? Right, take one quick look here. Manchester United employ 1,146 people, which is, look, nearly 100 less than last season. So already there's been some form of streamlining. But still, that is by far the biggest amount, well, the highest amount of employees out of anybody in the top six. I might do some research to try see if I can find how many other clubs employ. Now, truth be told, Man United is the biggest club in the world. Man United, probably going to need more stuff. But what this effectively is, right, if you want to cut it down to like a single sentence so you can understand, the intention is for this cost-cutting operate, whatever you want to call it, to reduce the workforce by 20 25%. That means... So what's that? How many would that leave United with? One, one, four, six. So if United cut 25% of the workforce, they probably wouldn't cut a person in half. I think that would be a bad idea. But cut that workforce from 1,146 people down to 860, right? Big reduction. Now, you'd only do that if you did that at the same time and you were nothing, everything still operated. Can... Three people do the same job that four people used to do previously. Yes, okay, then we reduce our costs. And by doing that, we reduce how much we're spending because this is a big number, all right? Ultimately, this is what it's down to. Again, boring, but the numbers matter in this situation. We go over here, you see, look, Manchester United, we had record revenues, right? Record revenues of 225 million in the first quarter of 2023. And nearly 200 million of that was an operating expense. Nearly 200 mil. Look at the year before. Revenue was 167 million. 
and the operating expense was 167 million. Revenue is not the measure of a successful business, right? It might look good. Oh, wow. Look, my revenue is like 600 million. How much did it cost you to get that 600 million? Ah, we spent 800 million. Hmm. Not really a good business, are you? You've lost 200 million in making that revenue. This is a big thing. And this is like the efficiency of a business. How much did you make? How much did it cost you to make it? You're in good shape. That's your margin. You want your margin in business to roughly be around about 30 to 40% to be considered safe. Well, that's how I operate on United People's TV. So if you make, for example, you make 10,000, just I'm doing it in, in round numbers so it's easy. In 10,000, you want your margin to be three to 4,000. So you don't want your costs to be higher than like 6,000. That's giving you a nice, comfortable 40% margin. That gives you safety. So if anything comes up, you're covered. You've got cash to spend. This is, the, this is what an efficient business does. Now, Man United's margin there is not high. Man United's margin the year before, they lost money. Man United's margin there, I can't be bothered to do the numbers in my head quick. Is that what, 10%? Roughly. Roughly 10% margin. And I've just told you, I think a safe margin for a business is like 30 to 40%. These, these, this is the thing that Ineos... I have complete and utter confidence that they're going to do this right, right? We don't even have to worry about whether they do this right or wrong. They will do this right. They're billionaires for a reason. This sort of business stuff, this sort of business stuff is really their bread and butter. So making, as I said, if the efficiency of making Manchester United a proper football club uh, from a business sense, making more money, increasing your revenues and reducing your costs. And that's what this one's for. Uh, and I'll be interested to see how, what, how big and, and wide the cost the cutting is. If, if you reduce the workforce by 20, 25%. Anoj, my man, how you doing? Gifting five memberships. Who's the five? Wait for the gong. I can't tell you how happy I am these gongs are just working properly. Do you remember how much hassle I was having? Apparently, all the hassle I was having around the software is because I'm using a Mac. I love the Mac. The Mac is brilliant for everything that I do editing-wise. But when it comes to streaming, it's not so good. So I think in the future, I might have to create a dual computer setup. And then I'd need everything plugged into two. It's complicated and it's expensive. Uh, but that would be the... Um, the next step for United People's TV in terms of the studio. Uh, did, 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 what are you saying down here in the comments? Let's read some of your comments out. In fact, no one's really... <laughs> the comments have gone a bit like... <laughs> it's. I apologise, right? You might find this stuff boring, but it's, it's these things which are going to make the big difference to our football club. One thing at a time, correcting all the... Mis I called it financial housekeeping. It is fixing the crap that the Glazers have done for so long. They have so much damage, right? So much damage. And that's what they are doing one thing at a time. Now, interestingly, um, James from the Muppeteers threw in another name yesterday and he's, um, fair play to him, man. He's, he's got some seriously good sources inside the club as kind of consistently has been for, for a long time. So fair play to him. Throwing in a new name into the hat for the head of recruitment role. And that's Carl McCauley. Carl McCauley, who has kind of followed Graham Potter around pretty much everywhere he's gone, right? Currently the chief analyst at Chelsea. He was a head of scouting at Chelsea before. And prior to that, he was at Brighton. He was at Swansea and he was at Ostersund. He's pretty much followed him the whole way through. So we've heard Dougie Friedman and I've got a deep dive planned on Dougie Friedman, but I'm waiting to pull the trigger before starting to produce it because I want to get a little bit more clarity. Dan Ashworth, what's happening? What's happened? It's, as I said yesterday, it's kind of all gone quiet. I I don't imagine there's going to be... I, I don't see how any sort of leaks to the press for Newcastle or United kind of help kind of help either of them in this situation. So I imagine they keep it tight. They keep it close knit. 
like I don't think Newcastle will gain any sort of advantage in negotiations by leaking anything to the press. They want an insane amount of money, all right? And the reason it's insane is because it's not relative to the contract which it is. So whenever you buy, I don't know, whenever you buy a footballer and they've got a contract and there's and there's a release clause in it that's reflective of how much that player is worth and how much that contract is. Dan Ashworth, I think, is on somewhere in the region of 1 to 1.5 million a year. And Newcastle want 20 million. I mean, you can do the maths. That's a lot of percent. Like, what's that, 2,000? Somewhere in the 1,500, 2,000% of how much his contract is. And Newcastle are just, as I said, they're, they're acting like a... They're not acting spoilt because they're not spoilt. They had a plan, right? They had a plan to become the new Manchester City. All right, I would, let's, uh, bring Saudi Arabia in. They got they are the richest people in the world. Ah, oh, we'll have no problems. No, this is it. We've won everything. Mark Ashley to to the public investment fund. Great, we've got it all. Ah, what do you mean we can't spend money? Ah, what do you mean there's new financial rules and restrictions? So they're already pissed about that. And then Man United come knocking, and they realise that their project is not what they think it is. They realise that the the long termness of that project is far longer than they think it is. They can't just come and spend all the money. They have to really follow a longer path and that's pissed them off and they're angry about it. And then on top of that, Man United, as I said, come knocking and their sporting director goes, I mean, it was a nice idea. I really like it. Thank Good luck, but now nah, I'm done. United have come knocking. There's only one place I want to go now. And they're angry and they're acting angry, right? And they, and they still are. So I don't know how long... I imagine this is going to probably go on for a while. Because I think they're just going to act stubborn. I mean, because he's already on gardening leave. They're already working without Dan Ashworth. Dan, you're saying it shows Ashworth is key to their plans? Of course. He was their sporting director, dude. He, he was leading their plans. He was the chief visionary. So without Dan Ashworth... They have to do a massive pivot. They have to bring someone else in to take all of that over. Um, yeah, but Carl McCall is an interesting one. Let's see if anything develops on that. So we've got Dougie Friedman, who's been linked with the head of recruitment role, and this is a massive role for United. And it almost kind of feels like whoever we get in from a head of recruitment perspective, okay, whether that's Carl McCauley there, who you can see Dan Ashworth has worked with before at Brighton, or whether it's Dougie Friedman that comes in. That person is going to be brought in with the blessing of Dan Ashworth. So we can do that before Dan Ashworth comes in. And it kind of feels like it's probably more likely that we get a head of recruitment before the Dan Ashworth situation is resolved. Don't know. That's kind of, that's kind of what my spidey senses are saying. Let's see if I'm right or wrong. Let me see if I've missed any super chats up here. I think I might have missed a couple. Um, Danish, thank you very much, dude. You're saying irony is Glazers considered United as a business proposition rather than a football club, but they didn't run that business problem. I mean, dude, how many times have you heard me on this channel say, like, United's finances are in the pits? Like, as a business, they have run this club so, so poorly. They are, and I repeat this, C R A P, they are crap businessmen. They could have and should have made so, like, They've made so much money out of United by being crap. Imagine how much more money they could have made out of United if they ran United properly. And we hadn't been in the pits for the last 10 years. That golden goose that they got would be twice the size. They've made money in spite of them being awful businessmen. They've just been there at the curve of football just going, woof. It's got nothing to do with how good they are. And that's it. And that, that they are I just I can't I hate them. I hate them with a capital H. Jim back. Thank you very much, dude. You're saying we're lucky it's Jim Ratcliffe and not a private investment a private equity firm doing this. If it were, they'd be ruthless, distill everything down to numbers and take away human elements. A really important point there. And it kind of, everything that I've seen from Jim Ratcliffe so far, I'm just I'm happy with. I'm happy with the the, the direction. I'm happy with uh, the ruthlessness is a big word that we've always used, right? Around Jim Ratcliffe and what he's doing. Okay? 
And I think he has been ruthless to a certain degree. And probably empathetic in other ones. Like, take Greenwood, for example. I think he should be ruthless. And not everyone does. That's the video I did yesterday. There must be more, more comments on that video. <laughs> Hardly anybody watched it. But there are so many comments on it. Uh, and it's um he's kind of taken it back. He's trying to see the human element. He's going to say, right, we're going to look at everything ourselves and make our own decision. When it comes to getting rid of, we call it Deadwood, of course. But it, there's different types of Deadwood at Manchester United. But there's lots of players who should be there. And that's what this summer is all about. I, I, I hope that this summer has to be the one that is different. Once upon a time, last summer, I think it was... When the news came out that West Ham had put in a, was it 60 mil bid for Maguire and McTominay? I was like, this is it. This could be like a 9 out of 10 summer for United. Because I because I I backed Mason Mount as a signing. I understood the, the exactly what Ten Hag wanted to achieve with the team. And given what I saw when, he, when it worked in the first season, I was... Putting that on the on the emphasis on the premise that it would work, the a two aggressive number eights would work in the Premier League, and, and it didn't, and it didn't. Robert saying ruthless aggression rings a bell. Is that anybody watched the gentleman? I only found it this week. Guy Ritchie series. <laughs> I was saying this to my mate. Anybody who watches anything that Guy Ritchie has done, like whether it's Snatch, whether it's Lockstock, whether it's the gentleman for the film or the gentleman series, if you're not English. You must watch this and go, what am I listening to? It must be so hard to understand because it's so, um, just the, the way that the dialogue is written. It's very localized, a lot of slang and how, it, <laughs> it must be really hard to follow. <laughs> I love it though. Um, Akash is saying, oh geez, don't forget the five mil that's gone out to Arnold as severance. So much money being wasted. So that's five mil to Arnold for severance, 10 mil to pay for the strategic investment the whole thing add on top of that a 31 million dollar payment to the rain group for doing that so that's 31 what's that down is it what's it call it that 25 million pounds plus 10 35 that's 40 million pounds that would have been spent on the sale and paying off richard arnold great businessman great great businessman they've just leached and Shaxx, you're there to cheer me up before I'm about to go into a um, an absolute rant about the Glazers again. <sighs> Let's move on, right? There's a cut. There's quite a few more important talking points I want to discuss today, and I, I, I think I say this to everybody. If I didn't do this live show every day, in the morning, I find it so hard to keep up with all the United news. Like we've, it's there's so many genuine talking points. Then this one is this one's more of a headline. Hence why we're just we're over half an hour in the show, and we've um, not spoken about this quite yet. Marcus Rashford, right? The Mirror saying that uh, PSG are going to come in with a seventy-five million pound bid for Marcus Rashford, and that he's being lined up as a potential replacement. Well, not a like-for-like -like replacement for a Kylian Mbappe because that's just that's it's just not. That's just not, right? What's your take on all this, right? The first thing I would say is 75 million. 75 million is nowhere near enough. Like, Moises Caicedo, how much was he? Was he, was he like 120 mil? Mudrick? I swear Mudrick was more than that, wasn't he? How much was Mudrick? Chelsea sign Mudrick. 88.5 mil. <laughs> 75 mil. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. Good luck with that. Marcus Rashford is, you're talking like north of 100, quite a bit north of 100. Grealish for 100 mil. <laughs> Mudrick for 90. <laughs> you're 75 mil for Rashford. Yeah, all right, lads. All right, lads. 75 mil for Moani. Go on, eh? eh. 
first, uh, first thing I'm saying is, yeah, good luck, right? No chance of that happening. But I said this, I think the first time I said it, in, actually, no, it probably wasn't the first time I said it in public. I said it to James Orcourt on The Ripple Effect. And I said, it just feels like just the way things are going that Mbappe to Real Madrid is an inevitability. And that when that happens, PSG are going to be looking going, right, we need another main, I suppose, a figurehead. They're going to be looking for either one or two figurehead signings. And Marcus Rashford will be part of those conversations. At 75 million, it's a very easy conversation. Toodle pip. See you later. There's going to be people that are saying, I can see one in the comment, Daniel Stone, oh, selling for 75 quid. We need a complete overhaul, this and that. Marcus, if you, if you, if you want to get into the horrible sort of business talk of football, Marcus Rashford as an asset is extremely valuable. He's just signed a new long-term contract. He's what, 26? I think he's 26. Is he 26? I think he is. Marcus Rashford's 26. Yeah, he's 26. Plenty of years ahead of him. Peak of his career, technically, years-wise, are the next two to three. There's no chance, no chance that Rashford goes for that amount of money. I don't... I have personal opinion on this, right? Personal opinion. And you can have yours, of course. I don't think Manchester United will be actively looking to sell Marcus Rashford. Okay? And I don't think Marcus Rashford will be actively pushing to leave Manchester United. I think the only thing that changes or the only thing that turns Manchester United's head is the value of any bid that comes in. And I don't think 75 million is even is enough to even enter a conversation. Which is a mad thing to say. 75 million, you're just going to go just bat, you're not even going to bat an eyelid. It's mad. So I don't know. I expect PSG to show genuine interest in signing Manchester United. I actually kind of expect them to put a bid in. But at that level, I don't think anything happened. I'm going to go read some of your comments out down here about Rashford. I'm sure they're all going to be lovely. Wendy, you're saying you can't see him going anywhere. Uh, Brian, you're saying Rashford's worth a lot more than 75 mil and he doesn't want to leave. Um, if we think Rashford should cost over 75 mil, it will bite us back badly when we try to buy places at Alexandria. No, I don't think that's the case because I think United are completely correct. Marcus Rashford is worth more than 75 mil. The market's massively inflated. We can't just pretend that Marcus Rashford isn't worth that amount of money because he's having a poor season. He is. Um, would any club pay Rashford more than he's on right now? Well, he'd have to go Saudi Arabia for that, wouldn't he? Um, but of course, PSG, remember that they've been, well, Neymar's left. Messi's left. Who was the other one? Neymar, Messi, can't remember. Di Maria's not there anymore. They've kind of moved away from their, their failed Galactico model. And they're trying to do something different. So... I don't know. Maybe maybe they just if Mbappe leaves, they'll actually pivot and go somewhere else completely. I don't know. Um Ramos, that's another one. Let's see. Again, uh, again, when it comes to what I said at the start of the show about financial housekeeping, there's a comment there from Ross, which I think is kind of fair enough. Saying 75 mil plus pure pure profit. Plus, getting the wages off the books, it's a starting point for negotiations. And again, as I said, if you if you speak about making Manchester United an efficient business, then that is a conversation to be had because selling an academy player does have a massive impact on the bottom line at our club. That's the reason why City were happy to sell Cole Palmer to Chelsea. It's the reason why academies now are, for some clubs seen far more as a way to sustain big investment in other players rather than, oh, we're going to try and bring through our academy players. They see it differently. They see that as the, as the way to allow you to spend more money. Whereas Cole Palmer, I, mean, I, I think I said this the other day, I would love Cole Palmer at United, man. Mm. Mm. Man. 
But they don't care because they've got a load of money for him and they could spend it on, a, on other players. The Rashford one is an interesting one. And I, my expectation is that PSG will actually make a bid. Depeche, I'm not saying City are the benchmark, right, in any way, shape or form. I'm saying that this is, this is a, the way that new financial restrictions have been put in place and the way that academy players and the way that it's structured and the way that an academy sale is almost kind of worth double to your bottom line compared to the sale of any other player, it means that is where the focus is going for a lot of clubs. That's You know what it is? like Clubs will always find loopholes, bending the rules, ways into the back door. That's what they always do. And academy players and the sales of academy players are is going to be one of those methods over the next few years. I mean, City have already started it. Chelsea have already been doing it. I imagine it's, you've seen that United have started to do it now. I mean, we're not getting any money from it, but you've seen in um, Isaac Hansen Aaron being sold or Zidane Iqbal being sold or um, looking like Alvaro Fernandez might be sold as well. Man United are now selling players off and getting a 25% sell on rather than just hoarding players in the hope that they're going to come through. That's a shift that we've started to do this season. And, um, oh, got a really exciting video coming out soon. I think I've said it to you already. I'm not sure the right day to release it. I mean, I suppose today could work. But the transformation of Manchester United's academy into becoming one of the world's best again. Got Manu and Garnacho coming through, two absolute elite level stars. And there's more coming. What's happened behind the scenes to make that happen? Got a video on it. Really, really cool deep dive. I think you'll like it. Um, Okundi, you're saying there's over a thousand people watching and only 294 likes. Well, if you can, ladies and gents, please drop a like on the video. It makes such a difference to United People's TV. Now, can I come with some good news here? All right. Some very good news. Alessandro <sighs> Martinez. We're hearing confirmation that Brentford is seen as the return date for Martinez. That's our next Premier League game. That is 16 days away. That's a quick old... It's not, it's not even that quick. By the time that happens, that will nearly be two months. We looked yesterday, didn't we? I think it was around about the 5th of February when he got the injury against West Ham. Man, that is a fast-moving season if it's, if it's going to be two months by the time we play uh, Brentford in, 13, in 16 days. I'm still annoyed though, right? I'm still annoyed about this. This idea that Martinez is going to be joining up with the Argentina squad. No plans for him to play. He's rather he's finishing his recovery in and around an international camp rather than at Carrington. And I suppose it, the, two th the, the two things I'm annoyed about, uh, number one, it feels like um, if he just stayed at Carrington, it can be completely controlled, measured in-house by our, well, to be fair, our club doctors. Maybe we should get him, get him away from him, right? Maybe just get him away, <laughs> get him away from them. Maybe that's, maybe, I mean, I'm looking at this all wrong. This is actually just United admitting that our medical staff are so bad that they'd rather he goes and does it with the Argentina team. <laughs> maybe there's some truth to that. But anyway, I think it's just a, it's just the, the flying, the the unknown. I hope it. I hope it works. And truth be told, I don't trust our club doctors, Tyler, down there. That's probably why. Maybe this is. I've been looking at this all wrong, and it's just dropped on me right now. It's actually better for him to go and do it with Argentina, be around his international teammates rather than staying at Carrington on his own. Maybe that would be a more beneficial way. Obviously, there'll be more more than one player at Carrington. Not every player is going to be going away on international duty, but. Brentford. And of course, if he comes back for Brentford, he comes back a uh, uh, big old time for games. Because I believe, and let me just quickly pull up the fixtures. I think I know what the fixtures are anyway. But I believe after Brentford, we play Chelsea away. And then after Chelsea away, I think we've got Liverpool. Let's have a quick look. Look at that. I spend too much of my life thinking about United. Anyway. Brentford away on the 30th of March, right? Five days later, Chelsea away. Then three days later, Liverpool at home. How United are going to manage this, right? 
a Thursday to Sunday game. Thursday, 8.15, Sunday, half three. Two massive games. Given our injury records, given our fitness, it is very unlikely that Martinez comes back after everything that he's done and plays three games against Brentford away, Chelsea away, and Liverpool at home within the space of eight, de- eight days. So that's going to have to be managed. Varane's going to have to be managed. There's no way that Varane plays all three of those games. I don't think Casemiro does either. I don't know how we manage to navigate those three with a quality starting eleven. Anyway, that's a problem for further down the line. We've got Liverpool to worry about first. Now, what can I speak about now? I've got a couple of talking points here. I'm not sure I actually want to speak about them. I'm not sure I can be bothered. I'll mention them anyway. Um, the Times here reporting that uh, Barcelona are calling their interest on Mason Greenwood. Atletico is still keen. And I covered this in my video yesterday on Greenwood. And I said, look, this is, this is what's happened so far. Okay, This is what his season's been like so far. This is what the meetings mean between Murto and Hargreaves. And they met in Barcelona with Deco. And then they went to Madrid. And they met with Atletico Madrid. And they met with Real Madrid. And probably met with Getafe as well about Mason Greenwood. And I did my video yesterday. And I, I made my... My opinion has been very clear on this the whole way through. Nothing changes. Nothing changes for me. I want to sell him. And it's just going to have to go down as... A massive, massive disappointment. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just speaking strictly from a footballing perspective. Um, My opinion on that is firm. and uh, I know not everybody is, all right? I can tell that from the comments yesterday. But Barcelona apparently calling their interest and Atletico are keen. I don't think we'll be short of suitors. I have, I don't know. It kind of strikes me that United will probably sell him for a relatively low amount compared to his age and his actual value, but probably with a 25% sell-on. I think that, that's just kind of what I think would happen. All right. Dean, you're saying what's the news on Hoyland? Well, if you ask the Danish manager, he's going to be starting against uh, Liverpool. And we'll get confirmation either way. Maybe we won't get confirmation. But we will hear about it from Eric Ten Hag in his press conference tomorrow. Uh, and final note on another player who could be sold or could not be sold. Um, James Ducker from The Telegraph saying that the police investigations that are still ongoing, by the way, with Anthony, they threaten any chance of United selling him. They're saying that the ongoing police investigation surrounding Anthony could scupper any moves. Manchester police and Sao Paulo police are still probing, right? Nothing's happened. Nothing's been dropped. It's kind of all just gone in the background. I believe one of the accusers against Anthony dropped the case entirely. I don't know how many more there are. I think there's two. I think there's two. I don't quite know. Um, and the suggestion is that that might stop Manchester United being able to sell Anthony. I mean, it would, wouldn't it? If, if Manchester United did our job properly, right? There is a real chance that we would have looked into the character of Jaden Sancho and we would have gone. There's a couple of concerns that we've got. Not from one incident at one club, but from multiple incidents at multiple clubs. As good as a footballer he is, there is a risk that he is very environment dependent and that's why he's shining in this Dortmund team with Harden. I think we should be concerned about it. Instead, Man United went after him so aggressively one summer and Dortmund said, no, you can't have him. We tried to sign him. We waited for a summer. We went back the next summer. Brilliant, we signed him. Jane Sancho, woo. And then the problems were there since day one. Truth be told, if we did our job properly and due diligence, it might have been a different conversation around Jaden Sancho. And if you're talking about Man United selling Anthony this summer, anybody Who's doing, who's doing their due diligence on Anthony and his character and everything off the pitch as well as on the pitch, there's going to be red flags. Lots of red flags. Um, don't know. Kind of strikes me that with everything that we've got going on at this club this summer and with the priority orders that we've got, I don't think Anthony will be sold this summer. I think he should be. But I think with the prices that Man United would receive and the offers we would receive, I don't think Man United will sell Anthony. 
because I don't think we would get a offer. I'm trying to think of how much we would get for Anthony as an offer. And you just put it down there. I think we could sell Anthony, but Man United would have to swallow like a 50 to 60 million pound loss on him. And I don't know whether, I might be wrong here because it wouldn't be Ineos accepting a loss. It'll be Ineos going, well, we're accepting that you made a massive bloody mistake before. All right. You're not in charge of recruitment anymore. All right. Let this be a lesson. This 50, 60 mil loss we're accepting on Anthony, this is not happening under our watch. All right. This is going to be the example that gets held. We could loan him out, Shaxx. That could be one way of it happening. All right. So it's how some transfers, quite a few transfers happen these days. Was it Gonzalo Ramos was loaned to PSG from Benfica? I think it was. With the intention of them paying at the end. We could we could loan him out with an obligation to buy for X amount. That could happen. So therefore, he's not at the club. He's not on the books. And you delay the concept of selling him. But it depends whether any of us are ready and willing to accept such a massive loss because it will impact our bottom line. Last couple of minutes of the show, fire in your questions and your comments. Oh, look at that. Just over a thousand comments today. That, that, I, <laughs> that blew my mind when I, when I saw that for the first time. Um, that's how many comments I read through and I try and keep on top of. So don't take anything personally if I ever don't read your comments out. I apologize, but there's a lot. There's a lot coming in. Um, Chetan, honestly, they should put these losses onto the sale of the club. It's just the structure that was and the structure that needs to be totally and completely changed. And maybe uh, if if Muppeteers are indeed correct, Carl McCauley is, is a name that's going to be thrown into the mix. Dougie Freeman is another name thrown into the mix of head of recruitment. They're the two big appointments that we still are yet to get confirmation of. It's the 14th of March. I hope we get one soon. Head of recruitment and a deal being agreed for Dan Ashworth. Um, what department is in most need of a reshuffle, she says Tyler. Well, your top two are obvious. Recruitment and medical. They're your two big ones, all right? It's not just about cost cutting. It's about getting, you know, competent people in who actually do their job properly. So that's a little bit different to this overall concept of a massive cost cutting drive. Reducing, as I said, Manchester United's operational expenses, which were nearly 90% of our revenue. That's not very sustainable. That's too close to the line. That has to be reduced. So we, even if we're doing record revenues, we need to pull back on the operating expenses. That's why that is coming in. And it's boring. But these are the things that will make the difference for us. These are the things that's going to make us a club that can actually go and spend money properly. Um, do you think Anthony and Greenwood situations are similar and should Anthony be re removed from the first team? Uh, if I'm being completely honest, yeah, I think Man United should have just, I think what he wasn't, at the start, I'm trying to remember what happened. He, I don't think Man United suspended him. I think Man, I think he didn't, he'd fly back to Brazil. And he was left out of first team involvement, like pretty much straight away, which was a different, was that a different take to Greenwood? I don't know if it was, well, it was different, but it felt like the right thing to do. And then I don't know at what point he came back. I don't know whether it was after one of the charges was dropped, but everything's still ongoing. Hmm. I don't know. Just be nice to talk about football, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Chris, watching your show while sitting on the balcony with a coffee. Watching over the old Trafford ship canal. Look at that. Big up to you, my man. What a way to spend your morning. Ah, that was a good show. That was a good show. I enjoyed that. Um, lunchtime video today. Unsure, if I'm honest. I might do a bit of a, a little bit of a deeper dive into the cost cutting, into what all these numbers mean and what that kind of does for Man United's summer transfer budget. I think that could be an interesting conversation. I'll see. All right. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Thank you, everyone, for your well wishes yesterday and a birthday. Actually got some sleep last night. That's why I'm in a better mood today. Um, big up to all of you. I'll be here tomorrow. It's Friday. We can do the Discord live calling. Can I just quickly say to everybody, get in that Discord server, man. 
I want to make this Discord the biggest and best Manchester United Discord that there is. You've got loads of great United fans in there doing great things. Like if you go in and look at the transfer news feed, there's going to be dedicated feeds about every single player that you can track throughout the whole summer. There's also the United News section, which Alex does a brilliant job of um, showing you all the news on a day-to-day -day basis. It's your like one-stop shop. It's not just a place you go and chat. It's a place you can get all the United news, all the United transfer news, and I'm going to be launching the Q and A's. They're coming, and the arms are going to be back this weekend. All right, and yeah, hopefully we'll get the Discord call working tomorrow. So members, you go in that member chat. Big up to all of you. I'll see you soon.